children, and I'm here to have a little discussion with you all about the state budget and the state of our children today. You'll notice if you're watching this on YouTube that there's a live chat on the right hand side. As we're discussing, please feel free to ask questions. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so sorry about some technical difficulties. Let's get started. So today we're going to talk about the state economy and sort of what's been happening with the state economy. Some state budget drivers, that is what is causing this fiscal crisis that we see of $5 billion over the next two fiscal years. Some of the budget proposals, what each of the four proposed budgets thus far do in order to close this $5 billion, loop, uh, $5 billion budget hole. And then some investments we think Connecticut can make to have a better approach and raise revenue. So first we're gonna talk about the state of our economy today. And the big picture I want you to get away uh, from the state of our economy is that the jobs we're growing today in Connecticut are different than the types of jobs we were growing five or 10 years ago. Now, during, during the last 15 years, we've seen a 13% decrease in the share of high wage jobs in Connecticut, the mostly high wage, high, high skill jobs, white collar, and a 20% increase in the share of low wage jobs. And we call this the job swap. And the reason this has occurred is because over the past 15 years or so, starting even before the recession, Connecticut has been losing these high wage jobs, mostly in manufacturing. And this was exacerbated by the Great Recession. So you'll see during the Great Recession, um, we lost almost all jobs in mid to high wage industries. This was mostly manufacturing, although during the recession, you also see a loss of construction jobs. Once this happened in the post recession period, even though 97% of the jobs we lost during the recession were in mid to high wage industries, not even close to that has been grown in mid to high wage industries since. And as a result, there's a greater need in Connecticut. This has great implications for the revenue we're gonna raise and the need for services in this state. Another way you could think about the shifts in the economy is the disparate impact of this recovery over the past five or so years. So you could see here, uh, this we have the, the gap between black and white poverty. So for instance, this says that in 2007, 11.5% uh, more African-Americans were in poverty than whites. And you can see that these disparities in poverty rates between African-Americans and whites and Latinos and whites have increased actually since 2007. So we're, so we're seeing racial disparities go in the wrong direction. And this is wrong, not just for moral reasons, but also for economic reasons. When you look at the demographic trend in Connecticut, you can see that more and more children in the state are children of color. And so if these children in the future are gonna be Connecticut's workforce, we need to make sure that they have stable childhoods with parents that can provide uh, for them and their futures that we have an adequate well skill or a uh, workforce with good skills going into the future okay so that's a little bit about our state but or a little bit about our state economy let's talk a bit about the state budget so today i'm going to talk about four aspects of the state budget how we got to this five billion dollar deficit i'm going to talk about the decreased revenue rising costs some tax myths which have gone in the way of some real uh, reform and also federal threats ahead. So first we're gonna talk about decreased revenue. Now, over the past 10 or 15 years, the amount of revenue that Connecticut has gotten has decreased for the general fund. So you could see before the Great Recession, before 2009 or so, uh, we are getting around five, six, seven, eight percent per year of revenue in revenue, revenue growth. And since then, except for two blips in 2011 and 2013, we've seen revenue growth of only around one to 2% this year. So not really as much revenue growth per year. With less revenue, uh, you might imagine that we're gonna have some budget problems. And just to illustrate this in concrete terms, this chart is the difference between the, re the, 2000, the recovery from the 2001 recession and the recovery from the 2008 Great Recession. And so what this says is that the green line says that in 2008, for instance, we were making 40% more revenue than we were gathering in 2001. In contrast, in the current recovery, we're only getting around 10% more revenue than we were getting in 2008. So in fact, if we had recovered at the same rate in this recession as we had for the previous one, 
we'd be raising about three billion more dollars per year, which would be covering uh, the budget deficit. So rising costs. So okay, so at the, at the same time, we're not bringing in as much money. Some people say, oh, okay. So if we're not bringing in as much money, then it must be a spending problem. The state must just be spending willy-nilly, and that's causing all these problems. Well, when you actually look at spending trends over the past 20 years, the rate of growth in the state uh, budget has decreased. So in the 90s, you'll see that the state budget in, uh, increased, the uh, spending increased by about 5% per year. Then from 2005 to 2011, you saw an increase of around 4% per year. And since 2011, since our recovery during the Great Recession, we've really ratcheted down on spending. And now spending in our budget has really only increased by an average of 2% per year. So the growth in spending really can't explain the entire story of why we have a budget deficit. So what is causing the budget deficit? The type of spending that has been increasing dramatically is non-functional spending. And when I say non-functional spending, I mean pensions, I mean retired health care costs, I mean teachers retirement, and I mean debt service. And the short answer to this is that pretty much this is occurring because the state has failed to save for its public worker benefits for decades and now the bill is due. So in fact, non-functional spending these costs since 2010 have increased by 41% or 1.7 billion and by 69% or 2.4 billion since 2008. In comparison, the tax receipts we've been getting, the revenue has grown by less than 4% per year on average over that same period. So what you can see is this is a chart of the share of the general fund that we spend on non-functional costs. So you can see in 2008, we spent around 21.5% of the budget on non-functional costs. Whereas in 2017, we're, uh, we spent 27.7%. Now, now, over the next two years, that's actually projected to increase to up to 29 to 31% of the budget, so nearly a third. When you compare this to the investments that we make in the children's budget, now the children's budget is our uh, recording of the state's investments or the state's willingness uh, to invest in children and families. So you can see that currently this, what the blue line says is that in 2017, we spent 29.5% of the general fund on children and families. What you can see is that as the share of the budget that has gone to children and families has decreased, the share of the budget that's gone to non-functional costs has increased. So it's just a correlation, but it's one that we feel like is worth saying. Now, there's a very important point to make about these non-functional costs, and that is, they, there are just some agreements with the state unions that you might want to heard about, and I think it's important to say is to talk about the size of the deficit in play. So this, so this is a chart of contributions to the state pension fund, the state employee pension fund per year. And this is what was planning on happening before last December. So basically what happened was in 1992, there was an agreement to pay off our pension liabilities by 2032 over a fixed, you know, relatively reasonable schedule. But in the mid-1990s, when we had lots of surpluses and everything looked rosy for the future, these policymakers negotiated an agreement to decrease these pension payments in return for a sharply increasing payments in the future, kind of like a balloon mortgage. Well, that far off point in the future is now. And you can see at that spike, the sort of increase would be uh, the expected contribution by 2032. I would also say that this was uh, due to some rosy assumptions by the state of 8% returns. If you use something more like 4.5% uh, return rate, then this would actually increase to 6 billion and not just 4 billion. So the state didn't think it could deal with this. So in December, it met with the state employee union and they changed the, they changed the uh, pension con contributions from the red line to the blue line. That is, uh, they spread, they avoided the spike by spreading out these costs until 2047. Now you may have heard of the most recent concessions, and the most important thing to know about this is that, I guess the most important thing is that uh, the employee unions decided to give up uh, 1.5 billion over the next two years in concessions, and part of that deal was reducing pension, uh, pension uh, costs. And so you can see here the green line is compared to uh, the, the December agreement. We have some decreased pension contributions over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. But I will say that this is just part of the agreement and not everything, and it still has to be approved by the unions. Okay, 
So that was one. That was two. Now we're going to talk about tax myths. So you might say, okay, we're not having as much revenue. We're having a greatly increased costs. Why haven't policymakers looked at bold solutions in order to reform our outdated revenue system? And the answer is people are scared and they're scared of myths about taxes. There are big two myths that I want to dispel with you today. So the first is the millionaire migration myth. The idea that if you increase taxes on the rich, they're going to leave. Now, when you look at the state uh, tax data, this just simply isn't the case. From 2010 to 2015, when we had a large tax increase, see that the people who, the number of returns in the top brackets, those making above $100,000 a year, increased dramatically. So you can see here, for instance, from 2010 to 2015, the number of people making from one to $5 million a year increased by 25%. So who's actually leaving the state is the people making $15,000 to $50,000 a year. Um, so it's actually our lowest income individuals who you know, might be le leaving because we aren't supporting them adequately. So that's one myth, and we just wanted to dispel that. The rich aren't leaving the state. OK. So the second myth is corporate tax flight. And so you all remember GE a year or two ago, and most recently, Aetna announcing it was shifting its headquarters. And the myth here is that if you increase taxes on corporations, they're going to leave. And it, But the thing is, when you look at what these companies actually said when they announced that they were leaving, they didn't mention taxes. What they said is that they want a place surrounded by innovation, with a strong business community, entrepreneurs, and venture capital. They want an innovation economy and access to talent. All these things cost money. Any plans to air this on the Connecticut network? I have no idea. It'll definitely be on YouTube, though. So this will be on YouTube for people to watch. So. I want to say a little bit about how damaging these myths have been as far as policy in Connecticut. The first, or just one simple way to show how these myths have been damaging to Connecticut is the types of revenue proposals that policymakers have been proposing. So this is a pie chart of the revenue proposals from the governor's original budget back in February. And 40% of the governor's revenue in that budget was raised on the backs of low-income families by cutting the earned income tax credit, which puts money in the pockets of working families, and also eliminating the property tax credit, which helps overloaded low- to middle-income families pay their property taxes and reduce the regressivity of the, sex, of the system. Yet these were taken away from low-income families. Another way you could see this uh, reduction very clearly is what this impact has had at the local level. So for example, this is the earned income tax credit cut, the estimated cut to the Hartford area. So you could see that in 2017, around $24 million, $25 million in earned income tax credits uh, were given out to the Hartford area communities. And the governor's budget would cut around 5.7 million of that, take that out of the pockets of working families, out of the local Hartford economy. Now, at the same time, these legislators are balancing the budget on the backs of low and middle income families. They're offering tax breaks for the wealthiest among us. And so, for example, cutting the state taxes, which the budgets do, uh, would amount to an average tax break of around $100,000 for 600 of the wealthiest taxpayers in the state. And again, I think a lot of this has to do with this idea of if you tax the wealthy, they're going to leave. So we're going to have to uh, cut their taxes in order to keep them here. And we know just from the data that that hasn't been happening. OK, so we talked about three of the problems. Now we're going to talk about the federal threats going forward. We've mostly talked about the state level. Now, the federal budget is so important to Connecticut. And it's important because 20% of our budget relies on federal grants. Uh, and you know, we'll have the impacts of you know, we could talk a little bit about the impacts of Trump's budget. I'll do that on the next slide. But one out of every $5 coming from the feds, we already have a $5 billion deficit. If we lose even more, um, it could get even worse. To give you an example of some of the different programs uh, in federal funding from the feds to Connecticut, Medicaid being the largest, SNAP, CHIP, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, the old food stamps program, the Child Care and Development Block Grant, which supports child care services in Connecticut. All these are really important services servicing low-income families and 
having them at risk could ha have serious economic consequences for the state. So I've laid out a bit for you about the problems. I want to talk a little bit about what policymakers have put forth to solve these problems. The big takeaway is that all four budgets take an austerity approach to the state budget. That is, it's an unbalanced approach that mostly cuts without raising new revenue or reforming our outdated tax system. So these are the four components of our children's budget, which measures the state's commitment to children and families. You can see that we have four components to our children's budget. We have early care and education, K to 12 education, higher education, and health and human services. Three of these areas seek significant cuts. I would say for health and human services, that increase looks really nice, but it's really just uh, Medicaid payments to hospitals. It's not really increase in programs for low income individuals. So not as rosy as it seems, but the big picture is that all four budgets would reduce the share of the budget devoted to children and families to an all time low, actually a 13% drop since 2008. You can see that on this slide in 2017, around 30% of the budget was going to uh, directly to children and families or programs that support them. In 2019, that would increase to 29 or even 28 and a half percent. So you might think that by uh, if, if policymakers are cutting, they're also raising money on the other end. So they're both cutting and raising money, finding strategic uses. And if you first look at the budget, you might think that the blue lines are the amount of revenue that the budgets say they raise. So the governor says he raises 1.5 billion over the next two years. Democrats say they raise 1.9 billion. House Republicans say they raise 1.3 billion. And Senate Republicans say they raise about 1.56 billion. But the problem is a lot of this money in, that, in those blue lines are really one-time budget gimmicks and transfers, taking money from one to the other, um, eliminating municipal aid. It's really not raising new money. And so when you account for that, for those tr what we call transfers, the shifts, the gimmicks, you get the red lines, which is the amount of the new the amount of new revenue they're raising. So you could see the governor's only raising 200 million, Democrats are raising just 666 million, and the Republican budgets are actually cutting uh, revenue from the state. This is not a balanced approach to the budget. So what would a balanced approach to the budget look like? Our vision is a state that would have a sustainable, transparent, and equitable budget that yields adequate revenue to invest in children, families, and communities. And this takes money. And you know what? Companies in this state agree. When you look at GE and Aetna, look at what they say. GE says, until you fix the roads and the public transportation system, it's hard to say that Connecticut's a good place for a big company. In a report about GE, uh, the report about GE says, instead of constantly addressing short-term budget crises, the state must show long-term fiscal responsibility, which includes investing in cities, in transportation, in education. These are all things that are really, really important. So what about that tax reform? I have a few different proposals I want to talk to you today. They're about modernizing the outdated sales tax we have, strengthening our corporate income tax, and overhauling our property tax system. So sales tax have, have declined as a source of revenue in Connecticut. If you look at the share of personal income or general fund revenues that have been raised from the sales tax, it, it, it's, it's decreased from 2001 to 2015. And the reason for this is that sales taxes are mostly for goods, so actual, physical, tangible things. They're not so much for services. That is, if you take a limousine ride, if you take, if you get a barber, if you go to the barber shop, if you take tennis lessons, these are all things that aren't paid for by the sales tax, even though there's still transactions going on. And as our economy moves more and more to services, our sales tax becomes more and more outdated and not in step with the local economy. If you were to broaden the sales tax to include services, you could actually lower the rate for the sales tax and still raise up to $730 million per year, go a long way towards reducing our budget deficit. Another policy you could look at is Connecticut's corporate income tax. So when you compare corporate tax growth to state corporate uh, tax growth, you can see that even though corporate profits have increased by 450% since 1991, Corporate income taxes have only increased by about a quarter of that. Now, 
That can be explained in part by the growth in business tax credits and some corporate tax avoidance. But there has to be some way to capture this uh, profit growth that is in step uh, with the tax growth in future years. So on a happy note, actually uh, very happy that the legislature has bipartisan legislation or has passed it to enhance the review process of business tax rates for economic development incentives, which we've partnered with the comptroller on. You can see here that business tax breaks, business tax incentives have increased by around 3% from 2016 to 2017, whereas the children's budget has de decreased by 1.3% over that same period. The third policy I wanna to talk to you a bit about is property tax reform. Now, property, tax are, property taxes are broken for a whole host of reasons. Uh, one of which is that they're very regressive. Uh, they, they're especially they're disproportionately regressive to people of color. They, they harm our cities, and one way, and also they create educational inequities. And so, one uh, way to get around this is to look at a style, or to look to our neighbors in Vermont. And what Vermont does is, when you're raising money for education through property taxes, you have equal funding for equal effort. That is, two communities that want to spend the same amount on education have to have the same tax rate to get there. And when you do that, you could actually give a tax break to 2.7 million residents, fully fund a pilot, and level the playing field for business property taxes across communities. To get, just to give you an example, you can see on this slide that according to our models, New Haven would get about a $93.7 million tax break, or could get that much, around $720 per person. Uh, to specify here, New Haven could actually use this $93 million for a tax break, more school aid, more service investments, et cetera. So $93.7 million more dollars to play with. So that's the presentation. Um, I'm Rain Unin at the bottom here. However, we have lots of wonderful, brilliant staff who can help you out. You can see their contact information here. I'm happy to take questions. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to say? So, Fantascus, thank you for the great question, or I should say, Paula, thank you very much for the question. Uh, a big box tax is very interesting. The, sometimes we call it the, the make Walmart tax. Uh, for people who don't know, this is a tax on uh, employers who uh, have employees who are making low wages. Partially, these employees rely on public services. So the idea is that you tax these employers since they're relying on public benefits. It's it's certainly a good idea. From what I understand, it's been introduced in the past and has not gotten very far, but it's something we should definitely be looking into into the future. Any other questions? You guys should be asking. I'm happy to answer. There's the live chat on the right. You can type in your answer or your questions or comments. We could also just you know have a little comments, a little discussion going on here. You can also ask on Twitter. You can tweet at us at CT Voices. So please feel free to tweet. Well, if that's really it, you guys are free to contact me at any time. My email and phone number are there at the bottom. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all a great day.